Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that have seen me have seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, finish it for me, keep my commandments. God is good. And all the time. How are you? It's nice to see you. Well fed. Well fed. Well, I tell you, which means all the blood now is not in the brain. It's down here. I need it up here. But we thank God for food. Can you say amen? amen. And that's a very serious statement. There are millions of people who go hungry every single day. And so when God provides food the way he did at lunch, we recognize God and we thank him. I was telling a friend of mine, develop the habit of thanking God for everything. As I told you two nights ago, you turn up the switch, the light comes on. There's someone who writes me every day from a certain country. And one of the requests always is the electricity jet just went off. Every single day. Two weeks ago, I was in a certain country doing some preaching. And two or three times a day, the electricity goes off. Several years ago, I was in a certain country. The power went off so often, people walked around at night with flashlights around their necks. So they can see their way. In these United States, you turn on the switch, mm, the light comes. If it doesn't come, you call the, 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 whomever is responsible, and if they don't move fast, you can take them to court. <laughs> you know, it's a, Ah, we thank God for the privileges we have in this country. Can you say amen? amen. But they will not last forever. Let's thank God for the sewer system we have. Now, I know you just had lunch, but <laughs> I've gone places. Where's the bathroom behind that tree? We thank God for water. We thank Him for city buses. We complain about the mail. We thank God for the mail system. Hmm? We thank God with all the police brutality. You call them, they still come. The fire department comes. Somebody goes hiking somewhere in Montana, falls off a cliff, a helicopter comes. Your cat gets stuck in a tree, you call the fire department to get it down. <laughs> Are you following me? I tell that to my friends elsewhere, and they cannot believe a fire department would come to get a cat from a tree. <laughs> it makes no sense to them at all. What am I trying to say? As you walk, whatever, thank you, Father. When I go up and down the stairs in my house, Father, I thank you, I can go up and down the stairs. You go to the bathroom, Father, I thank you, no one had to help me. This is no joke. 
we should live in a state of thanks. God is good. And all the time. Do you love God? How much? This much or this much? Don't hit anyone. <laughs> this much. And you wish your hands were longer. I look forward to seeing God. What do you say? I usually say God is a nice person. I like God a lot. I know we love him, but I like to say I like him. Let me give you my personal testimony. God has never done me anything wrong. Never. All my problems are my own doing. All my blessings are from God. God has never done me anything wrong. Let me generalize that. God has never done anyone anything wrong. Mm -hmm. For God so loved the world, come on, tell me, that he gave his only begotten son. That is a God who cares about you and loves you. <laughs> While we were enemies, he loved us. While we were sinners, he loved us. While we were weak and ungodly, he loved us. And he loves us so that that love would attract us to him. Then we realize we serve a God who was willing to sacrifice himself for our salvation. You did not hear what I said, so you said nothing. God's love is so great, he was willing to sacrifice himself for our salvation. That's love. Love is self-sacrifice. Not sacrifice someone else, sacrifice yourself. Is there anyone with us? You're not the Seventh-day Adventist. You are here for the first time. May I see your hand? You're not a Seventh-day Adventist. You're with us for the first time. May I see your hand? Your friend is listening on the phone. What's her name? Monique. You tell Monique the entire church says hi. Tell Monique God bless her. Tell Monique we've never seen her but we love her. And tell Monique we want her to come physically, even if she lives in Alaska. We want her to come <laughs> and worship with us right here at the Pasadena SDA Church. I, we have a baptism, 4.30 I think, Pastor. And then a question and answer session, so we still have quite a bit to go. But there's something I want to place on your mind before I get to that let me ask what I always ask. Well, let me pray for Monique. You said she's on the phone. Oh, let me pray for her right now. Oh, what's your name? Maria. Maria. My mother's name is Marie. Same thing. I think Marie is the Spanish version. Marie the French. Mary the English. Maria, how are you? Oh, <laughs> Were you way above all of us, you know? <laughs> We're grateful to see you, Maria. God bless you. God bless you. We have a perfect guest. God bless you. Maria, where are you from? Yes. Armenia. I have some Armenian friends. They're seated right around you. <laughs> Maria, thank you. Say amen for Maria. Say amen for Nicole, who's on the phone. Let me pray for both of them right now. Oh. Monique, Monique, yes. Yes, sister. Your friend is online. What's her name? Leah. Leah, God bless you. Now, where is Leah? In, at her, in the, where? At her home. Where's her home? In somewhere here. Well, her home is here. Okay, all right. <laughs> Leah, Monique, and Maria. Anybody else? You're not a Seventh-day Adventist. Let me pray. Father, thank you for Leah, Monique, and Maria. They've joined us personally and online. In the unfailing, all-powerful name of Jesus Christ, bless them. Father, you know what's best for them, better than they themselves. As a loving, tender-hearted father, touch them in the areas of their need. Touch them so closely, they God, that by faith will see your fingerprint on their lives. Protect them, provide for them, 
And wherever they go, let their lives be a billboard of the love of God. Save them when you come, dear Father. In Jesus' name I pray, let all God's people say, Amen and Amen. Let me introduce two special friends of mine sitting back over there. Dr. and Mrs. Delacruz, please stand. These are very, very precious friends. Any others came? Who? On the way. Now, who's that there? Oh, Grace, Grace, stand up, Grace, Grace, Grace. Were it not for Grace, I would not be alive. Grace, stand up. God bless you. No, I'm serious. That lady takes care of us. Those are very precious friends of mine. And the Lord knows that I would make any sacrifice for them, including the sacrifice of life. These people mean more to me than you can guess. Some others are on their way. If they come while I'm up here, I will introduce them. All right. God is good. Come on, say it with energy. God is good. All the time. All the time. Before I get into it, what's your favorite Bible for someone on this side? Too slow. That side. That's a what? Say it again. John fourteen twelve. What does it say? Uh -huh. God bless you. Someone on the side? John 1 29, which says? Uh huh. Yes. Now Jesus wants to take your sins. I travel a lot. I see people with backpacks getting on the planes. Christ has a backpack with your sins. Let him carry them so that there's no bump on your back. Give them to Christ. That's his work to carry the backpack. Of your sins and mine. Someone else. Your favorite Bible verse. 1 Corinthians 10.31. Which says. Yes. That is not symbolic. <laughs> that is. And that's really is right in line. With what I have to say this evening. One more on this side. Say that again. Philippians 4.13 says what. I can do all things through Christ. Which strengtheneth me. Which means I can conquer all sin Amen. through Christ. Yes, my dear brother. Oh, you raise your hand in affirmation. I can conquer any sin through Christ. I can forgive that person who hurt me through Christ. I can keep the Sabbath through Christ. I can start returning a faithful tithe through Christ. Mm-hmm. Because Christ is the one who made heaven and earth. You're dealing with the omnipotent. It is possible with the power of Christ within you and me to do what we could not do in our earthly power. All right. What do I always ask you? If you're not using one of these, please turn them off. Why? To preserve reverence in the house of God. And you have done that. God bless you for that. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say what? Lord, Put your words in that man's mouth. That is based on what Bible verse? Which says what? Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put, come on, my words where? In thy mouth. And favor number three, think. What Bible verse? Isaiah 1.18, the first part of that says what? Come now, let us reason together. And my fourth request, please tell me to what? Slow down. You have not done that. Do you mind right now repenting? You have not been asking me to slow down. You must do that. Please. Can I trust you to do that on the last day? Let's pray. Father. Thank you for the joy of fellowshipping with those whom you love. To the point that through Christ you gave yourself for them. As we bow in your presence, O oh loving God, forgive our sins. Fill our hearts with hatred for sin and an ever-growing love for righteousness. We thank you for our guests in person and online. And I ask today, God, to pour out your spirit upon us 
that he may enlighten our understanding, possess my mind, possess my body, take full control, dear God, I offer no resistance. Use me, Father, for the proclamation of truth. Bless our friends online. Bless this country and every country represented by those watching. Father, help me to make the message simple, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen, amen and amen. amen. What is your priority in life? Don't tell me. When sin contaminated the earth, what became God's priority? The salvation of man became God's priority. And so the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Ella White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 131, paragraph 2. What did I say? Page 131, paragraph 2. Listen carefully. Speaking of Jesus Christ, she writes, He not only became an exile from the heavenly court, but for us took the risk of failure and eternal loss. He not only became an exile, from the heavenly courts, but for us, took the risk of failure. This is true. Satan knew that Jesus could have sinned. That's why he tempted him. Let me tell you briefly about Satan. He used to be the very highest angel in heaven. He was the most powerful angel in heaven. He still has all that power, but he lost the position. You need to hear this again. I'll say it differently. When Satan was thrown out of heaven, he took all his power with him. He just lost the position. So the power he had in heaven, which he used for good, he now uses for evil. Are you with me? For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. He became an exile from the heavenly court. Jesus Christ. At the risk of failure and eternal loss. And I said Satan knew that Christ could have fallen. And I reference Satan only to say he was the wisest angel God ever made. Thou sealest up the sun full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now sealest up the sun. There is a modern equivalent for that expression. It simply means... When God made Lucifer, he broke the mold. Are you with me? Lucifer was the highest expression of God's ability to create. The faith I live by, page 66, paragraph 2, Ella White writes, Of Lucifer, God made him good and beautiful, as near as possible like himself. The closest thing any creature ever came to being God was Lucifer. But he could not be God because God cannot be created. But Lucifer, by God's arrangement, came as close to being like God as any created being could be. He was the wisest. I'll tell you something else. Desire of Ages, page 761, paragraph 5, Elohite writes of Lucifer, to him as to no other created being was given a revelation of God's love. You didn't get it? Let me say it differently. God revealed to Lucifer the depth of his love in a way he revealed to no other angel. Not even Gabriel. I'm saying all of that to say Lucifer knew that Jesus Christ could have sinned. That's why he went after him. And so when the writer says, he not only became an exile from the heavenly court, but for us took the risk of failure and eternal loss, there was a possibility that Jesus could have sinned and the entire plan would have been messed up. But he still took the risk. Because our salvation was more important to him than his own life.
Our subject, when position two is not enough. When position two is not enough. I just said Christ valued us above his own life. And I'm sure someone is having difficulty swallowing that. Let the Bible explain for you. Go to the book of John. Well, not John. Let's go to Philippians first. Philippians chapter 2. We'll read verses 3, 4, and 5. Philippians 2, 3, 4, and 5. When position 2 is not enough. It's 425. When does the sun set? I think it says of 536. Do you have Philippians 2? Yes. Reading from verse 3. Father in heaven, continue to be with me, I pray, please, in Jesus' name, amen. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, give me one word for lowliness of mind, humility. Finish that verse. Let each, come on, esteem others, come on, better than themselves. To think like that, you have to be converted. Because the natural thought of the carnal mind is numero uno. Are you with me? That's the way we're born. Numero uno. I'm number one. The Bible says, let nothing be done through strife of in glory. Are the board members listening? <laughs> you see, when you guess, you can cause trouble and then get on a plane. <laughs> Let nothing be done through strife, whether the board or your family, of in glory, but in lowliness of mind. Without that lowliness, what's about to follow cannot happen. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Which means, if someone comes to that door with a gun, and he robs all of us, he says, I need to take one of you captive and I may kill you. And he picks someone from this side. Someone who says, no, don't take him, take me. And nobody said him. <laughs> nobody said him. Listen to me again. If you and a brother, you and a sister, you're walking down the street, someone pops from somewhere with a gun, wants to, you must step in front of your brother. Kill me. Let him go. When they came for Christ in the garden, what did Christ tell the Romans? Take me, let them go. Let each esteem other better than themselves. This is not symbolic. Look at verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, finish the verse, but every man also on the things of others. Now, if you combine verse 3 and verse 4, what kind of mind are you to have? A mind that does what regarding other people? When I say other people, I mean other believers. <laughs> Are you following me? Other believers. You must value them above yourself. Now, read verse 5. Come on, read it. Let this mind be in you, which was also where? In Christ Jesus. Now, putting two and two together. Let's see if we can get four. Where is this mind located? Where do we read about it? Where do we read about it? Where? Where? Chapter 2, what verses? 3 and 4. Mm. Let this mind, which mind? The one described in 3 and 4, which says, put others ahead of yourself. Now the Bible says, that's the mind you must have. Because that's the mind Jesus had. Now, listen to Genesis 1.26. And God said, let us make man in our image. That has always been the mind of God. A self-sacrificing mind. It became evident when sin occurred. God did not learn to be self-sacrificing. He has always been that way. 
the expression of that mindset became necessary when sin blighted this world. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. God valued you so highly, he was willing to sacrifice himself. Now, my brother's favorite verse, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, finish the verse, do all to the glory of God. Now, who must be on your mind and mine, no matter what we do? God. So God must always be, because number two is not enough for God. He has to be number one. And he wants, because he has made you, through Christ's sacrifice, number one. Let me tell you this very... Who died on the cross? Jesus. Did the Father die on the cross? Did he give himself through Christ? Yes. Now I can't explain it. The Father sacrificed himself through Christ. Go to John 15. What's the subject? When position 2 is not enough. Go to John 15. Let's read verse 12. Do you have that? Read with me. This is my commandment that you love one another how? As I have loved you. Which means God's standard for us when it comes to loving is a divine standard. You don't love the way people love on YouTube. Or soap operas. Or Hollywood. You've got to love how? The way God loves. This is my command. It's not to be discussed. Or negotiated I should say. This is my command. That ye love one another as I have loved you. And he loved us self-sacrificially. Listen to me. If we loved one another like that. Arguments would virtually vanish. Because you don't hurt the thing you value highly. Ah, uh, you're not with me. Value protects. If you have a Mercedes Benz, and then you have a Ford Focus, are you with me? With only three wheels. And I come to you, loan me one of your cars, which one would you give me? The Ford Focus. Because you value the Benz. If I'm telling the truth, say amen. Mm. You'd pay me for the gas. You'd give me money for the gas. Just don't ask for my bends. Because I value it. Now, ladies, where's your wedding dress? Is it in the basement? If you have something precious, don't you put it in some place safe, like a, a, a safe or a... You go to a hotel room, isn't there a safe? What do you put in the safe? Tissues? No, you put something valuable. Because you have put value to it, you protect it. If you're in a house and you hear fire, fire, get out. Take only important things. What would you take? The television set? You take your passport? Your wallet? Gone. Because these things are valuable now. Let me ask you this. If we valued one another, there could not be racism. Because you don't hurt what you value. You protect what you value. Is that sinking in? There could not be racism if this biblical principle were applied. Esteem other better than yourself. We could not have the Brahmin in India and the, the untouchables at the very bottom. The one who clean outhouses. Couldn't have it. Because I value you. Now, let's look at Paul as he expresses this valuing mindset. Go to Acts chapter 20. Acts 20. What are you supposed to tell me? <laughs> Why do I have to tell you? I have to keep telling you to tell me. Come on, tell me. You're such nice people. Tell me. You promise? 
All right. What book did I say? Acts, what chapter? 20. Let's read from verse 22. Paul is speaking to the elders of the church at Ephesus. It will be the final time he'll speak to them. These are his parting words. And now, behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, Acts chapter 20, verse 22, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city that bonds and afflictions abide me. All I know, by the spirit, I'm heading for suffering. Now read verse 24. But come, none of these things, come on, move me. Stop. When the church tells you, let's go give out tracts, what do you say? What's your objection? It's a, it's, a, it's a rundown area. It's a high crime area. Paul says, look, none of these things move me. Amen. Keep reading. What's the, what the next statement say? Neither count I my life. Come on. Do it to myself. Why? That I might finish my course, come on, with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says, look, my mission is higher than my life. Amen. Now, when that's the way we think, Pasadena will become Adventist. That's right. Then Riverside. The Burbank. What's the other one? El Segundo. <laughs> when our mission, we value it above our lives. But as it is now, you ask a church member to do this or that, the person does it as just a courtesy to God. Mm. Father, you better be lucky. I have half an hour. Mm. Neither count I my life dear to myself that I might finish my course with joy. Joy in sacrificing the life. Now, I quoted my brother, let, 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 whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. If that's the case, then God is always where? First. And that's literal. But when you live like that, you look strange. Because the lifestyle of heaven, when lived on earth, makes you an alien. You didn't hear what I said. Anyone on this earth living the heavenly lifestyle will look strange and odd. Out of place. Which he or she will be. But that's the way we should live. Because the Lord's Prayer says, Thy will be done in earth. How? As it is in heaven. What happens when we do not put God first? We put ourselves first. Now, go to Haggai chapter 1. Haggai is one of three prophets, along with Zechariah and Malachi, who prophesied after the Jews came back from Babylonian captivity. Haggai is an interesting book because he has precise dates for the events about which he talked. He gives about five different specific dates that scholars can use to date uh, his book and his uh, presentations. Haggai chapter 2. One, reading from verse 1. Haggai is about two books from Malachi. Malachi, Zechariah, Haggai. Do you have it? One of those little books we seldom preach from. Where are my King James people? All right. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto whom? Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the what? Governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josebek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying now. What does God say? What does he say? This people say. Who is this people? The Israelites, the Jews. Instead of saying this people say, what should God have said? My people. The very fact he says, these people means something's not right. <laughs> Are you following me? <laughs> when the Israelites were rebellious, God told Moses, the people whom you brought up from Israel, from Egypt, you. When they were obedient, I brought them out. Are you following? <laughs> God never. <laughs> so God said, this people say, what did they say? The time is not come that the time the Lord's house should be built. Now. 
When the Israelites came back from Babylonian captivity, they, about 538 or so, 37, they started working on to rebuild the temple. The work stopped in 534 did not resume until 520, which is when Haggai is speaking. They had been 14 years of inactivity on the temple. The, the, the altar had been built and uh, some foundation, but the temple itself had not been built. There was discouragement. Uh, people went about their own business. And so God sends a message to Haggai. This people say, you know, people are very crafty. Yes, I'll do evangelism, but this is not the time. During the civil rights struggle, Martin Luther and the others were told, you have a good cause, but this is not the time. <laughs> When's the time? Ah, 50 years from now. And so they said, the time has not come that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? Now God is saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not time to build my house, but it's time to build yours. The church of God should never look like a wreck when your house looks like a palace. The church of God should not lack when we have everything. Position two. Is not good enough. And so God says, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell? What does it mean by sealed houses? You know, tall roofs with chandeliers. And this house lie waste. Verse 5. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider, look at your life. Read with me. Ye've done what? Sown much and bring in little. <laughs> Stop. Crops were not succeeding. Because God is not first. He have sown much. And bring in little. Keep reading. Ye eat, but ye not. Mm-hmm. Ye drink, but ye not. Mm-hmm. Ye clothe you, but there's none. Warm. Now, read the next statement and weep. Come on. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with hole. Have you ever wondered, where did the money go? There must be a hole in my pocket. I got paid yesterday. And I'm broke today. Look at your relationship with God. Is he first? You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there's none warm. You've got six coats and you're still shivering. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into the bag with holes. When God is made number two, his blessing is withdrawn. To a degree that should catch your attention, something is not right. And in my church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, much isn't accomplished because members put their business ahead of God. Forgetting this is a temporary arrangement, this world. We're not here for the long haul. The long haul is coming. Let's go to verse 7. Thus saith the Lord, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and do what? And bring wood and build a house. And I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. You looked for much and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Whatever you brought home, said God, God, and it vanished. Read verse 10. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. Now, what do you understand by the heaven over you is stayed from dew? No rain. Because God commands the clouds, don't drop your water. Literally, God commands the cloud not to drop. The Bible says that. Do not drop water. Verse 11. Come on, read my people. 
And I called for drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labors of the hands. Everything you do, I curse. Nothing works out. Why? Because you've got me at position two. Question for you. Is the work of God our priority? Don't answer me. Or is your degree more important than God's business? Is your career more important than God's business? I can just ask. I cannot pass judgment. Because I'm not God. All I can tell you is what the Bible says. When God is at number two, he says, okay, we'll let number one bless you. <laughs> let number one bless you. And there's no number one who can bless you unless that number one is God. Read verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and all the remnant of the people, come on, obeyed the voice of the Lord. Uh huh. And the voice of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God have sent him, and the people did fear before us. When Haggai spoke, the people said, Okay. When they said they fear, they started to respect and obey. The message hit them. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. Now God said, I'm with you. You've, you've got a change of mind, a change of attitude. I am with you, which means it's clear they had put him back where? Position one. I'm with you. Now read verse 14. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and they came and did work in the house of the Lord of God, the Lord of, the Lord of hosts their God, in the 420th day of the second month, in the second year of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. When they changed their attitude, God said, I am with you. And except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh in vain. There are some of us who think, well, God or no God, I'll do this, I'll do that. Listen to me, go to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi 1, when number 2 is not good enough. Malachi chapter 1. Ah, okay, God bless you for finding it first. Who else has it? Amen. Let me pray, Father, as we continue. Speak through me, dear God, and remind me to slow down. In Jesus' name, amen. Are we there? The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have what love you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? <laughs> Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob and I hated Esau. Pause quickly. Let me defend God. God doesn't hate people, but he loved Jacob more. Did you hear what I said? Yes. He preferred Jacob. God has degrees of preference. I loved Jacob. I hated Esau. Jacob had several wives. One was Leah, where he had two, Leah. And what was the other one? Rachel. The Bible says he hated Leah. And he loved Rachel. Meaning he loved Rachel more. God said, I love Jacob. I hated Esau. Meaning he preferred Jacob above Esau. Now, here are commandment keeping people and the rest of the world. God loves the commandment keeping people more than the rest of the world. I can always tell when you're saying to me, explain that. Go to John 10, then I'll come back to our Malachi. John 10. John chapter 10. Let me ask you a question while you look for John 10. Have I been keeping my opinions out of these presentations? All right. I wanted a witness. 
What book did I say? John, what chapter? 10. Let's read from verse 16. When you found it, say amen. amen. Another sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall be one fold and one. Now, read verse 17 carefully. Therefore doth my father, why? Because I laid on my life that I might. Yes. What Jesus is saying, there was a love for him that the father expressed, but had not been expressed before, because of his willingness to die. Now, Ellen White writes, Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 924, paragraph 5. Never was the Son of God more beloved by his Father, the heavenly family, and the unfallen worlds than when he humbled himself to bear disgrace, humiliation, shame, and abuse. Never was the Son of God more beloved than when he humbled by the Father, the heavenly family, and the unfallen worlds, than when he humbled himself to endure disgrace, humiliation, shame, and abuse. I can't explain that. More love flowed from the Father. Now, let's get back to Malachi 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness, the snakes and the lizards. Whereas, now read verse 4 with me, whereas Edom saith, who is Edom? That's Esau, same Esau, he's Edom. He was called Edom because he sold his birthright for the pottage which was red. And Edom means red. So that's when he got that name back in Genesis 25. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished. Read with me. But we will return and build the desolate places. Pause. What is their intention? Come on, you just read it. To build. We're going to build. Okay. Here's what God says. Thus say the Lord of hosts, come on. They shall build. But I, come on, will throw down. No matter what you do, says God, I'll knock it down. Because you're not right with me. You build, I tear down. And there's some people who can testify to the fact nothing works out. Because God is in position two. The gospel is in position two. And God has to respond. They shall build. I will throw down. We as a people must have a clear... Well, let me go to Jesus again. He speaks better than I. Luke 14. We always see Christ as sweet and lovely, which he is. But we, we think of him as soft and weak because he was merciful and didn't hit back. When they spat on him, he never hit back. So we call him soft. You know, in the, in the, in the rap industry, it's supposed to be hard. Are you following me? You know, the brothers don't understand what hard. You're supposed to be hard. You must have street creds. Mm -hmm. Jesus had no street creds, so they thought he was soft. What book did I say? Luke 14. Let's read verse 26. Listen carefully. Are you there? Come on, read with me, my people. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, finish it, he cannot be my disciple. He can be a church member, not a disciple. What I'm trying to tell you, your life must be secondary to the gospel. Peter lost his life for the gospel. Jesus lost his life for the gospel or gave it up. Paul got his head cut off for the gospel. One disciple called James got his head cut off for the gospel. And you and I, in these last days, this critical era of earth's history, will God request any less of us? 
when he's just at the door to come? Those of us who are more privileged than any other generation in history. Why? Because to us have been given the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the testimonies. Elijah didn't have that. Paul didn't have it. That's why I said to us has been given truth more than any other generation on the face of the earth. And if those people can give up their lives, are we to get to heaven in luxury? By luxury I mean putting ourselves ahead of God. When number two is not enough. Let me tell you something else about God. God is not egotistical. God is not self-centered. The only reason why God wants to be number one is because he cannot save you from number two. Are you following me? So he's still thinking of you, not him. God cannot save you from position two. He has to save you, come on, from position one. When I say that, he has to be in position one to save you and me. He cannot do it when we demote him to position two. So position one for God is the position of salvation. Do you not understand that? When you remove God from that position, you have signed your death warrant. And that's not surprising because the carnal nature is suicidal. Why do I say that? It is sin. What does sin bring? Death. The carnal nature is suicidal. And so remove God from number one and place him where he is unable to save us. Not unable because he lacks the power, because we will not permit him. Where number two, is not enough. And Paul said, neither count I my life dear unto me, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. But let us go back now to John 15. We went there. I left abruptly. Let's go back. John 15, we read from verse 12 again. Somebody in your heart right now just ask God put his words in my mouth. Quietly in your heart. Pray that please. You have John 15 verse 12. This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. That's the standard. Now read verse 13. Come on read it. Greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friend. What is the greatest expression of love then? Self-sacrifice. Ah, God bless you, my handsome brother. Self-sacrifice. If God says it, it must apply to him. Because he said in verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another. How? As I have loved you. Then he tells us about this love. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The, the, com, the love God is commanding in verse 12 is explained in 13. It's a self-sacrificing love. Love your brothers to the point you'll die for them. But the Bible tells that very blatantly. 1 John 3.16 Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, nobody memorizes that verse. <laughs> we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And I told you earlier, through Christ, the Father gave his life. Don't ask me to explain. Through Christ. That was the arrangement for the gospel. How can I give my life for these people? I will do it through my son. That's what the Bible says. God was in Christ. Reconciling the world to himself. God was in Christ. 
reconciling the world. Hebrews 9.14, that Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Through the eternal spirit. The spirit was involved. The heavenly family sacrificed itself to save you. And we turn around and tell God, take position two. I have a house to build. I can't contribute to the church. I'm planning a wedding. I can't contribute to the church. I want to go from master's to PhD. I can't contribute to the church, not finances or time. Sometimes God says to us, oh, you don't have time? Okay. You're busy working? Okay. Let me fire you. And then you'll have time. Now, this is serious. I'm not sure I should tell you what's in my head now. It is serious and solemn. God may say, oh, so your child is the center of your life? You finish it. Aha, uh -huh. oh, your spouse is all your life. Okay, you finish it. God wants you so badly, he'll take other people out of your life. Now, they'll be saved. Don't panic. They're fine. He's trying to get you. So Christ died that through his sacrifice, the Father may get us. Very often, God allows a calamity on this man to catch that woman's attention. When Christ suffered on that cross, all the abuse, when he finally died, what did the Roman centurion do? and say truly this man was the son of God as he observed the sufferings of Christ attracted him Amen. the only position from which God can save you and me tell me that position one if God is number two in your life right where you sit make a decision by the grace of Christ to elevate him to position one is it time for you, O oh ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? In other words, take care of my house first. When Elijah came to Zarephath, the widow said, I'm gathering two sticks to make two cakes for, my, for me and my son, then we'll die. Elijah said, make me a cake first. Then make for you and your son. Now, Elijah represented God. Elijah said, by the Spirit's conviction, make a cake, bring it to me. Don't make three, then bring, no, make mine, bring it to me, then go make yours. Someone will say, what a harsh God. That's a widow. Not broke on welfare. And the church comes telling her, contribute to the church building. Yes. Because he who gives to God or she who gives to God will be repaid by God. Amen. Pressed down, shaken, and running over. This is not symbolic. But the greatest gift you can give God is not money. Your life. Life is time. Mm -hmm. 
When you give God time, you've given God life. I got up at about four something. It's now five or four. Let's say I've been speaking 35 minutes. You have lived for 35 minutes. Am I wrong? Are you dead? You've lived for 35 minutes. Life, time, virtually the same thing at a practical level. So when we waste time, come on, finish my words, we waste life. You want to give God your life? Give him your time. But God has an agent on earth through which you can give your time. That's the church. When God knocked Saul off the horse on the road to Damascus, Acts, number nine, Acts chapter 9, Saul said in verse 7, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Jesus sent Saul where? To the church. The church will tell you what to do. Because the church speaks for me. You didn't hear what I said. Let me say it differently, and I'm digressing slightly. God has an agency on the earth empowered to speak for him. As long as they speak from this. Because after Jesus told Saul, go to Jerusalem, uh, the city which was um, Damascus, then Christ went to, Ant to uh, Ananias and then told Ananias, what to tell Saul. I'm really digressing, but this is my last presentation. Which means, God does not bypass his church. Because the church is the body of Christ. Are you with me? You know, Christ could have told Paul right there, uh, do this, do that, do mm -mm -mm -mm, Go to the church. Because the church will speak with authority. The voice of the church is my voice. If it says what I said, he then told Ananias what to do, what to say. Ananias did exactly what God said. The voice of Ananias was the voice of God. So when the Seventh-day Adventist church says the seventh day is the Sabbath, that is the voice of God. Even if the person saying it is an expert hypocrite, that is the voice of God. Because it is truth. What's our subject? When number two, opposition two, is not enough. What does God want? One, not for selfish purposes, but for salvation purposes. It is only as he is one. He can change my life and yours. How many of you want your lives changed? Can I see your hand? The pastor wants to do evangelism. That's why you exist as a church. The church is not a social club where you hang out with people who eat the way you eat and drink the way you drink and possibly dress the way you dress. The church is an agent for the salvation of souls. The church is a, is, is a, is a headquarters for God's special forces. And your general, who's under Christ, wants to mobilize you to do evangelism. Let me ask you to take a safe risk. Give God some time. Please, see what happens. When the Israelites did not give him time in the days of Haggai, 
he called for drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon men and upon cattle and upon all the labors of the hands while he was number two. At number two, he can't bless you, but at number two, he can curse you. Are you following me? He can't bless from two as he wants to, but he can curse you from two. And when God curses you, it's an act of love to gain your attention. Edom said in Malachi 1 verse 4, We shall return and build the desolate places in opposition to God. What did God say? They shall build, come on, I will throw down. But what God builds, you can't throw down. Yeah, you didn't hear me. What you and I build, God will throw down. What God builds in us, no one can throw down. My, I call upon you the name of Jesus Christ who gave his life for you. What are you willing to give for him? How many of you will say, Father, help me to cooperate with the evangelistic program of this church so I can be used by you to bring someone to Christ? May I see your hand? Help me to cooperate. Uh, stand up with me. And stick by this commitment. And see the glory of God in your life. Stick by this commitment. For those of you from other churches, you're standing as a commitment for that church. You must be aware that God will not send an angel to preach. He has you. Mm -hmm. Now the angels would love to do it. But God bypasses them and calls us. Is there anyone else who will say, Father... Let me finally make a decision to be baptized or rebaptized. Anyone? You've not yet made it. You need to make it. A decision for baptism, rebaptism. Just raise your hand. If you're shy, tell the pastor. But it's good to do it publicly. It may inspire someone else to do that. You know, some people become copycat criminals. They learn of a crime on television, they go do the same thing. We need copycat righteousness. Are you following me? Anyone? Father, I'm making a decision to be baptized or rebaptized. Has bowed eyes closed. Remember, you want to see the pastor privately because you're shy? Do that. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the human drama in the Bible. And how you're involved going to the extreme to save people. Please help us to understand, dear God, that when we demote you to position two, your finest blessings cannot be poured out. You cannot save from position two, but you can surely curse from that position. Now, God, using the divine common sense you've given to us, all of us will now, Father, by faith, Say in our hearts, dear God, we put you back to position one. Sit on the throne of our hearts, I pray. Father, we want to give time to the work of evangelism. That's why the church exists. Bless the members of the Pasadena church. Give them the spirit of cooperation with your leader. That souls may be one for Christ. And for those present from other churches, let them take that spirit of willingness to their churches, their God. Because the Bible says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all men, and then shall the end come. All nations, then shall the end come. Father, you're not waiting for the papacy to do anything. You're waiting for the gospel to be preached. And that's us. Help us to do that, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray, let God's people say, Amen. Amen.